So now we'll um, look at the seventh tanka in the series of 15. This tanka covers the time in Lama Sakaba's life from, his 30, from when he's 36 until he's just 37, just two years. Um, but this is an extremely eventful time in Sakaba's life because he makes a huge transition from you know being a student, a young student, to being a middle-aged student, to finishing his studies and then becoming a renowned scholar and teaching. Then he, he leaves all of that and trans, you know, transforms into a great yogi and meditator. I mean, not not right away, but basically he leaves that kind of study, um, st uh, the the focus of life on study changes to focus on meditation and practice. So together with eight of his closest disciples, um, he he sets out from Trumalung, which is an area near Lhasa, goes across the Tambo River, and then goes to um, a region called Oka which is about probably, I don't know, one or two days walk uh, from Lhasa. It's a very remote area where he'd done retreat in the past. So he goes into strict retreat there with, um, with these companions. So they, don't, uh, they focus at first exclusively on the sutra practices and uh, teachings of the Buddha, don't do any um, tantra practice. Um, and, and they focus especially on purification uh, through practicing, through making prostrations to the 35 Buddhas and accumulation of merit through making mandala offerings. So it's said during the, the next few years, Tsongkhapa made um, um, 100,000 prostrations to each of the 35 Buddhas. So he did about three and, three and a half million uh, prostrations. And then made so many mandala offerings using a stone, a large smooth stone as a base, um, that he rubbed his, his forearm raw until the bone uh, showed through. So, in short, he and his companions, they made great exertion um, in, in practice, um, also not eating, uh, eating very little food, and um, you know, spending day and night in um, meditative practice. So, this, um, so they're crossing the river in a boat, you know, going into retreat, is depicted at the bottom right-hand corner um, of this tanka. And then the next scene to the left of that, um, has Tsongkhapa and then other disciples are making prayers, doing meditation in a house uh, in Olga, in the retreat house. Um, and then in the sky above them, there are um, they had visions, they had repeated visions of the 35 Buddhas to whom they're making prostrations, and also different aspects of Maitreya Buddha. Um, so those are depicted in the sky. And then above them, then just to the left of that is a scene where um, at one point Tsongkhapa had a vision of Again, I had a vision of Manjushri, of the 35 Buddhas, of Maitreya, uh, Medicine Buddha, and Amitaya. So you can see there, there's a uh, Manjushri surrounded by a kind of a circle, circle of golden Buddhas, the 35 Buddhas. And then directly below him is, is a blue Buddha, so that's Medicine Buddha, and then Amitaya to his, his left, and uh, Maitreya to his right. So Tsongkhapa has a halo around his head, as he usually does in most images. Tsongkhapa is depicted with a halo around his head, and he's looking up at this image. So it said at this time, uh, Tsongkhapa had the thought that perhaps he should go and teach, upon which Manjushri said to him, what is the great benefit from teaching all these unruly sentient beings who are so difficult to train? Therefore, I think you should discover the path that satisfies yourself and others by single-pointedly engaging in practice and isolation. So at that time, uh, Manjushri very strongly told him to stay in isolation and keep doing retreat. Then the next scene, you see there's a, a standing um, image of Buddha, that's, that's Maitreya Buddha, um, the emanation of all the Buddha's loving kindness. Um, and there, so there's a famous statue of Maitreya in, in an area called Zingji, which is very near the area where Lama Sakapa was doing retreat, um, which was built probably several, several hundred years before that, um, and has a special connection with upholding the Vinaya, the monastic discipline in Tibet. So it was built as in order to create an auspicious cause for the monastic Buddhist order to remain in Tibet. So at that time that Tsongkhapa went to see it, it that, that temple and that statue hadn't been cared for for a long time. So it was quite dilapidated and run down. And um, it said that Tsongkhapa felt quite um, sad upon seeing the state of that, that statue. Um, so not in this tanka, but later on in the next tanka, Tsongkhapa comes there again with his disciples and they engage in a great project to restore that, that temple and that statue. So then, um, at the top left-hand corner, at the top of this, this tanka, on the top, you see there's three circles of um, different uh, holy beings with Manjushri at the center of each, 
And then in between those is this great wrathful aspect of um, Manjushri, Yamataka, Vajabharava, which appeared also in the first tanka and uh, one of the previous tankas as well. So here, uh, these are different mystical visions, illustrations of different mystical visions of of Tsongkhapa during this time when he's doing intensive retreat. So in the the top right hand, uh, the top left hand circle is Manjushri, uh, surrounded by a great halo of blue light. Um, I'm sorry, just the one the one just below that. So there are appear the great uh, some of the greatest Buddhist scholars, such as uh, Nagarjuna. Asanga, Vasubandhu, um, Dignaga, Dharmakirti, uh, Kamala Shila, uh, and Abhyakara, and others. So some of the greatest scholars of the Nandu tradition, they appear in, in a vision of Tsongkhapa in the space before him, surrounding um, Manjushri. And then in a circle just above that is, um, again, Manjushri surrounded by the 80 Mahasiddhas. Tsongkhapa had a vision of the 80 Mahasiddhas. So the 80 Mahasiddhas are these great tantric yogis of ancient India. Again, most of them studied and trained in the Nalanda tradition, um, but then, you know, then they kind of left the way of just a, um, a strict study and scholarship and became kind of sort of radical yogi, yogi practitioners practicing, you know, emphasizing Tantra and showing kind of sometimes bizarre aspect and miracles like flying in the sky and so forth. So Tsongkhapa having visions of these is an indication. So some of the Mahasiddhas are Saraha, Luipa, Gantapada, and Nagpopa, um, and other of the 80, 80 Mahasiddhas. So Tsongkhapa having visions of these is an indication that in the future, he will um, base most of his practice and his uh, scholarly works on the basis of the, the, the works and the, um, the teachings of these different Buddhist masters of ancient India. And then just to the right of that, so just directly above Tsongkhapa and the Tanka, so you can see, just a note, in this, the central image of Tsongkhapa, he's in a very yogic aspect here. He's holding a Vajra and Bell, and, and his hands crossed in this kind of uh, mudra of showing unification of method and wisdom. And he's holding a Dharmaru in his left hand, um, which is connected with Mother Tantra. So it's showing that in the, at this time of his life, then Tsongkhapa is putting emphasis on meditation and practice, and also more and more um, practicing Tantra. Um, so directly above Tsongkhapa then is this great tantric uh, deity, the, the wrathful emanation of the Buddha of Wisdom, Manjushri. So the deity is called Yamataka, Vajabharava, um, 13 deity Yaman, uh, Yamataka it's called. So Tsongkhapa had a very powerful and direct vision of this deity. And it said from this time onwards, from that day onwards, Tsongkhapa did the self-entry. Um, it's a kind of meditative practice, very extensive meditative practice in relation to Vajabharava for the rest of his life every day. Um, then, just to the right of that, as we look at it, is uh, yet the third circle with Manjushri at the center holding his blazing sword of wisdom above and surrounded by many uh, Buddhist saints and masters. And here, from the heart of Manjushri, you see a long sword extending to um, Tsongkhapa, to, to the heart of Tsongkhapa. So it's said that this is a, another mystic vision that Tsongkhapa had where, you know, a heart extend the Manjushri's sword of wisdom extended from his heart and touched Tsongkhapa's heart, and then along the sword, a stream of nectar flowed down and flowed, it flowed into Tsongkhapa. And at the same time, if you look carefully, you can see in the Tanka, there are little streams of nectar flowing off the sword into the mouths of the other monks and lay people seated just below Tsongkhapa. So it's said that this, um, at this time, it was a vision that not only Tsongkhapa himself had, but it was like a shared vision with many of his disciples and many of the lay people who were there at that time. Um, and that some actually saw Manjushri in the sky, some uh, some only saw kind of other other auspicious signs, some didn't see anything. Um, some also, they saw the nectar flowing to Tsongkhapa's heart, and some they opened their mouths and nectar flowed into their mouths. Some didn't see, um, some didn't see anything, but they felt the nectar flowing into their mouths, and some didn't see any anything at all. So it's said that based on this vision, this was like a prophetic sign that in the future, Tsongkhapa himself would achieve the highest realization, full enlightenment um, in that life. And then many of his direct disciples would also achieve very high level of realizations. And then other, um, other of his disciples and other lay people would achieve varying levels of realization of high and low, depending on how much nectar they received. Not, yeah, so that's just like a, a prophetic vision indicating levels of realization. Then, um, in his 37th year, um, during the Days of Miracles. So the Days of Miracles are 
uh, this, this, um, there's four major Buddhist holidays in the year, right? So the, the most important is the day um, comes in the fourth month of the lunar calendar. It's the day on which Saki, Shakyamuni Buddha um, took birth, um, became fully enlightened, and entered Parinibbana all in that same that same day in the lunar calendar of the year. So that's Sakadala. That's the most important. The next is the day when the, the Buddha first ter- first taught the Dharma. It's called Wheel Turning Day. It's about two two months after Sakadala. Then the third is just about is just coming up. It's the day when um, it's called Lava Buchan in Tibetan or dis- descent from Tushita Heaven. During the 15 days of miracles, Tsongkhapa arranged vast and extensive offerings. When generating an intense yearning, he invited the objects of offering to come to that place. Akshobhyas were seen to fill the eastern direction, like mustard seeds in a pod. In the same way, Radna Sambhavas, Amitabhas, Amogasiddhas, and Varachanas were seen to fill the southern, western, northern, and central directions, respectively. Then he made inconceivable offerings. For 15 days, he saw these Buddhas and even, uh, even saw them during daily activities.